Max Gawler, Melbourne Football Club. You're listening to the Coaches Panel. This is Nat Fife from the Fremantle Footy Club. Trent Cochin from the Richmond Footy Club. Scott Benderbury from the Collingwood Football Club. You're listening to the Coaches Panel. Patrick Cooch from the Carlton Footy Club. It's Rory Sloan here from the Adelaide Crows. This is Tom Mitchell. You're listening to the Coaches Panel. Hey, it's MJ from the Coaches Panel. I hope you're well. Is your 2024 season done? Don't worry, we're going to open up the black book for you and help you through. Are you needing to get on or off some players in these critical final two weeks? We got you covered. And then there's some big injury concerns and confirmed outs that we've got to talk about all on this week's AFL Fantasy Strategy Roundtable. Two weeks left to go in your AFL Fantasy season. For some, you could not hope it hurries up and ends quicker, while for others, season high personal best ranks are at stake or your league finals victory. We're going to help you figure it out as we work through this week's AFL Fantasy Strategy Roundtable. It has been a number of months since we've heard this man's voice on not only the coaches panel, but he was a central part of the pod pod over the past number of years. We've managed to squeeze him out of the chaos of his life. If you're watching online, we're keeping the mystery of what he looks like, although you probably know from a pod pod listenership. Uh, Louis, mate, nice to have you back on deck. How are you? And a very interesting last two weeks in the AFL fantasy season for coaches, isn't it? I'm good, mate. Yeah, and it's certainly been a bit of a minute since uh, I've podcasted last, so thanks for having me on. Um, yeah, keen to talk, talk a little bit of fantasy, mate, and these are always the uh, the most intense couple of weeks for the coaches that are competing, and uh it's probably a little bit opposite for the coaches that maybe aren't right up there um, in the crux of the ranks, but there's always uh, sort of matchups that you've got in your in your keeper leagues, your drafts, and even yeah. your head-to-head matchups in classics. So there, there's always something to keep you pretty engaged there. Well, and even if it literally is, man, I'm going to take some learnings for 2025 and I'm going to pick some players now that I just want to see what they look like in my team and do some strategies. So so there is always something to play. But but before we get to Harry Sheasel, we need to talk about him with him a test for this week. We know Tim English is definitively out. Like I said, I do want to open up the 2025 Black Book and go through our hot and cold players that would be jumping on and off this week. We probably should talk loopholes. We know the benefit of AFL fantasy with the ability to edit trades and two trades a week of use them or lose them. It does give us the option to look at how we loophole players scoring, both with those who have early in the weekend fixtures and then those who sit themselves later through there. Are there any players and or teams that you're targeting or looking at based on the AFL fixture over the next fortnight that you go, yes, these are the types of players I'd be benching as an emergency option and then trying to loop on. And then conversely, those that later in the round, I'm looking to either trade into or flip onto my ground. Oh, I think there's certainly um, players which we'll get onto later on in the podcast in terms sure. of who can come onto your ground to play a few of those loopholes. But uh, in terms of how you can do it, there was a mate of mine, Jordan DeSena, who posted on Twitter uh, a couple of weeks ago, actually, and he just let people know uh, some of the teams that were going to be playing on Sundays most often for the rest of the year. Uh, and those two were the Dogs and the Blues. So at the time were three. That's obviously going to be two now. Yeah. Um, so you're probably going to want to be targeting. You shouldn't really need to downgrade for cover now. Yeah. Uh, and Maybe you do, you like to play it safe, but what I would be looking at now is looking at some of those basement guys for the Dogs and for the Blues who aren't going to be playing, who you can use on your field if need be to loop some of those better scores on. And uh, if you're trying to sort of whistle down into what those players should be, if you can find a DPP where you can potentially swing from a forward and defense or a forward mid type, then those are the winners that you really want to be picking. Yeah, I I think you're right. The Dogs, they're the first game of both Sunday for the fixture, so that's super helpful. While this week, the Blues uh, are one of the last and then second last the following week. So you're right, those are the two teams that if you're looking to maximise some loopholes and some scoring prospects, those are absolutely the guys um, to nail. So I think you and and your mate Jordan are spot on with that. Maybe we should talk about Harry Sheasel while we're here and maybe um, it, it lends itself to a little bit of fixture with North Melbourne having a Sunday fixture for us this weekend. 
maybe we will know on Thursday night if he is indeed out. Frankly, I don't know why they would even get close to risking him. If there's any sense of doubt, he's nowhere near 100%. Like, why are you taking arguably your future captain into an element of risk matchup when your season is well and truly done? So I've I've no idea why they would do that. But let's assume he's named um, different if he's obviously out Thursday. Let's assume he's named and he hits that moment that Matthias Philippou owners experienced last weekend where you see and hear that dreaded late out. Uh, what are our trade options? Obviously, the whole gamut of options in defence are available to us if he's missing Thursday, but using the Sunday laid out scenario, who are the players that you think are the viable parachute options? Should we need them if Harry Sheasel is a laid out this week? Matt, I reckon you've got a couple right off the bat, so I'll quickly right. throw that one to you and then I'll give you my thoughts on them. Oh, uh, I got a couple. I think the fact that the Blues sit right in that sweet spot with with a Nick Newman, one of those final matchups, has that Sunday, gives you the visibility nice and early. Uh, and the Newman we know has got 140 ceiling potentials about him. It does feel a little bit points chasing based on some of the last two kind of weeks that we've seen from him. But definitely Newman sits in that space of laid out panic absolutely go. If you're looking for an early fixture matchup in terms of negating the player that is potentially taking big scoring games away from you, you might be tempted to put a Lockie Whitfield if you want to play a bit more of a neutralized. And then, geez, if you want to go unique, I'm not saying I would do this by the way, but if you want to sit in the unique spaces, you've got a West Coast Eagles and an Elliot Yo type who was really valuable and popular for us at the start of the season. We know he's got 110, 120 potential and you want to create some point of difference in either our rankings and or a league matchup. He sits there. So I think Newman will be the popular one that people will go to if indeed we need the late out parachute. But I think the beauty of it is that we, we do have some options available. It's not like it's the last game of the round, yet Philippou style, where it's like, man, I've got three teams to choose from and, and no real great options. We do have options for us, which is helpful. Yeah, it is. And hopefully we find out about this late out, um, you know, not too close to that game because that's where yeah. it will become a bit tricky. And that's where uh, that first guy you mentioned, you know, Nick Newman is probably going to be the number one candidate that coaches go to just based on recent form. Uh, he's got like a couple of nice matchups. I've got it written down here. Eagles and Saints. So yeah. uh, those are two teams you can be relatively confident about. He's got a high yeah. ceiling there as well. Um, and not that he's got to worry about it either, but there's uh, plenty of job security there in that cult and have a few injuries at the moment. So Ooh, yeah. a little bit extra added responsibility there perhaps. Where it does get a little bit interesting um, is if you're going to go outside of that. I don't mind like a Dan Rioli. He comes up yeah. against the Hawks this week, uh, which true. I don't mind as a matchup. And then Gold Coast Suns, who he's been rumoured to uh, – potentially be off to at the end of the year and uh, always love that if you can add a couple of dollars to his contract I think he <laughs> might uh, play out of his skin there so those are probably the two um, following that North Melbourne game that you could pivot towards I think yeah it's a good shout and again we might know on Thursday evening when teams drop and now all of a sudden as, as we'll look through in a few moments who our best defenders are to trade into Man, now the options become available to you and you could get whoever you want. But we, we deliberately wanted to give you those early warning parachutes of save that trade for Sheasel um, that's available. Because because it does matter to us, doesn't it? Like there were some coaches this weekend, Louis, that were locked into Philippou and maybe they lucked into a lackey Aaron Cadman score, but, score, but there were some that were – they are copping a donut because they had players like a Billy Dowling that wasn't playing. So knowing when players are and aren't playing and where there is potential injury or, or laid out risk, which we know about Sheasel, that, that's important to hold. So I'd definitely be where I could managing my trade cadence coming into this week, should Sheasel be named? Because as far as, frankly, I'm concerned, not that it really matters to what North Melbourne, what I think, why are you playing your best player if he's even half injured? Like, what are you trying to gain here? So uh, I, I'm with you. I, I think it's more likely to be Thursday we know, 
But I, I think we need to have that trade back pocket ready to go from a Sunday perspective. What we do know, though, Louis, is Tim English is out this week. I suppose you could put Mackay and Kerno uh, as well as a bunch of others that we know, but they're, those two are probably more draft or super coach relevant. Is it just as simple as if you're an English owner, we know it's a trade, but is it just a two horse race of whichever of Cherry and Marshall you don't have you're trading into, or is there a little bit more opportunity to scope to look elsewhere? Or is it just a two horse race really? No, oh, look, you, you're probably pretty spot on there. I, I, I wouldn't rule out Max Gorn entirely. I think he's playing yeah. for potentially a little bit of pride there. The last two games for Melbourne, um, but you, you, look, you've got to go off recent form here and Rowan Marshall and Tristan Cherry uh, have been far and away the best ruckman this year and they're, they're just getting it done every single week. And um, certainly if it's Tristan Cherry that you don't have in your side, then what an opportunity. Jump on immediately. I think he's going at about 151 or something close to <laughs> the last, last three, three weeks. Yeah. So that that one's a no-brainer. Uh, put it on him and put the C on him. Uh Failing that, Rowan Marshall is your next best option. And then and then you go into your Maxi Gorn. So these are yeah. all names that we would have been speaking about pretty much all year. We know the sort of form that um, that they're in and what they can produce. So I think it's a two-horse race with yeah. uh, Max Gorn coming in not too far behind. Yeah, it's true. Like Tristan Cherry's going for a world record AFL fantasy for 150-plus scores in a row. Now, we're all talking about it. We're all likely jinxing it. Um, but gee whiz, based on his current form, who he's got matched up against this week too, like there's a world where your VC and C is Cherry and Marshall based on the matchups this week. So I agree. I, I think it is a two-horse race. Gorn owners will be happy enough to hold him because it is a favourable matchup this week too. But I, I, I'm with you. I think it's a bit in that two-horse race. Well, well, in the premise of talking about who you're trading out, we did this last week with Jorox. I thought it might be an interesting exercise to bring in again for this week and look at the players that – who are you trading out this week? Now, with the high probability that you're not going to trade back into them, so it's guys that you look at this week especially, but half an eye to next week and go, oh, there's just something about this fixture that they have, the role that we're seeing some deviation, um, and then even just what their current form might be that's giving you enough cause for concern to jump off. And then we'll do the same, but for players that we'd be looking to trade into, whether it be two great matchups and a really positive one this week or the next couple of things. So we want to give you a bit of a hot and cold trade in and outs line by line. We might start with the trade outs in defense. Do you want to lead us off, Louis, with if you were trading out of a defender this week, who would it be and why? This episode is brought to you by Allstate. Some people just know they could save hundreds on car insurance by checking Allstate first. Like, you know, to check you have the tickets in your wallet first before you drive two hours to the big game. Seriously, you had one job. Now the closest you'll get to the 50-yard line is parking lot D. Yeah, checking first is smart. So check Allstate first for a quote that could save you hundreds. You're in good hands with Allstate. Savings vary. Terms apply. Allstate Fire and Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Northbrook, Illinois. Yeah, I thought for this one, I would go with someone who's pretty highly owned and yep. has been uh, pretty much for the whole season. He was an extremely popular starting pick, and that was Hayden Young. Um, look, his form hasn't been too off. I don't think anybody was really expecting him to be putting up consistent 100s every mm. single week, and uh, you're probably thinking that he's maybe overachieved a little bit all year. The only reason I've got him here is just because uh, this first year in the midfield as a full-time midfielder, I think he's tiring just a little bit. I can see that with some of his efforts when I'm watching him play. And I just think that um, for Fremantle to fight and get into that top eight, they're not going to be passing it around doing that cheap stuff. And I think there's going to be a bit more of a reliance on some of their players who are maybe um, arguably more match uh, winners like a Sarong, a Jackson, um, a Darcy if fit, even a Brayshaw at times. I think they're going to be relying on those senior heads to really get it done in there. So for that reason, uh, Hayden Young's probably a little bit unlucky there for me. Yep. Yeah, no. And again, what you're trying to do in these final two weeks as much as 
look for ceiling types of players is you're also looking to create an element of separation, whether it be in a matchup or a rankings perspective. And his ownership, Hef from um, the Keeper League pod, does a great job over on X, really unpacking for you what the ownership of the top 100 is, let alone then the overall, which uh, you you can see within the tabulation of of every player profile. Uh, Like that's really important. It's not just jumping on the unique that can create great matchups for you, but it's also getting off the popular guy that based on form or fixture, as you mentioned a little bit of the eye test, you go, you know what, I'm not into that. I'll talk about Fremantle mids in a second, but it's not a great matchup for the next couple of weeks for them. So I like that shout. I think that's really good. For me, it's a bit more unique um, if you want to go a bit out there, but I, if I've got a Bulldogs defender in Bailey Dale, who was a great value pick at, at portions during this season. His last three, I know we're down to the last two, but his last three are, are, were really bad matchups. He's got North and GWS to go, and these are all bad matchups from varying scales for players that sit in that designated kick wing, let alone general defensive line. And so from a Bulldogs perspective, Dale, yes, has 120 plus ceilings about him. But if I was sitting in that unique space, oh man, I wouldn't want no part of it. Because where there's for classic and for rankings, where there's safety in numbers in ownership, where they, you know, for Hayden Young, say he delivers a stinker of a 70 this week, the overarching population of AFL fantasy are like, well, everybody has him. But when you get a unique guy that stinks based on a fixture, Oh, I want to get off that straight away. So for me, for the few that are sitting with Bailey Dale, I'd be pulling the eject button. I'd be wanting to jump off that. Let's head to the mids then, Louis. Who's the midfielder you'd be looking to trade out of this week and why? Uh, yeah, for me, this would be Noel Anderson, who's uh, quite a young player for the uh, Suns. I've always highly rated him and he's shown... Uh, to be frank, some some frightening ceiling in the past. His matchups aren't terrible here. He's got Melbourne and the Tigers. So from that perspective, I'm not writing him off by any means, but it's just the way that he's scoring lately, I'm not sure um, is sustainable to keeping his scoring up and about over 100. I look at his tackles. He's got four tackles in the last five weeks. Yeah. It's just not his role in there to really pad the stat there, which is what can get us those um, extra fantasy points we like to see. Obviously, Matty Rowell is the one getting it done. He's looking at um, what, seven, eight tackles pretty much every single game. I think he leads the competition four tackles as well. Um, so it's very much more of an outside role for Noah Anderson at the moment. And unfortunately, it's just not translating to points in the last couple of weeks. He's gone... In that time, 78, 85, 98, and 94. So yeah. um, given that one of those games is going to be away as well, at people's first where scoring can sometimes be a little bit up and down, I think you're okay here to just cut your losses. 837K, he's not got a massive price tag on his head anyway, yeah. but I think it's uh, it's not going to take you too many dollars to jump up and find a player that can potentially do- drop you that 110 to 120 plus scoring that you really want to see on your on your way home. Yeah, I really like that take. I'm keen to unpack that with a little bit more with you because we've talked about it. And I'm sure other content creators have talked about it too. That the last month, from a fixturing perspective, would indicate that Noah was a great trading option, let alone at the price point that you could have got into. What you said, Melbourne and Richmond, these next two weeks, I think he's gone about 110 plus average at home this season. So all these indicators are pointing towards hold, let alone trade into. But you bring up this interesting element, which is, yeah, they're they're all true and valid and absolutely indicative things that we could look at. But you're now bringing in the form and the other elements of the players in there too. And so while we're there, which of these variables do you hold with a greater value? Is it recent form? Is it opponent? Is it venue? Like where do you take these mixtures and hold them together? Because I, while I agree with you, I also think a lot of would say, well, the fixture says trade into Noah, let alone now you're saying, look, maybe it could be a trade out here. Yeah, look, it's the impossible question to answer, yeah, really. All these things, true. you need to find a balance somewhere and, and you need to create your own narratives in, term, in terms of what you believe. So for me, yeah. um, I've always been a big proponent of 
wanting my mids to tackle if they're if they're not getting too many tackles each and every week and you know um sorry it was five in the last four weeks would yeah. suggest that that's not his role uh i go throughout the stat sheet he hasn't had big tackle numbers all year and when he has he has gone extremely large so it's clearly that's where he's sort of losing his fantasy game he's he's not struggling to find the footy mm. um his marking is up as well which like I said suggests he is playing a bit more of that outside game there's every chance that he can drop that big score uh, but I feel like those big scores do drop off towards the back end of the year um, just from a general fantasy standpoint yeah uh, I think the Suns are probably getting a little bit tired if we want to go into recent history throughout the years uh, suggests that the Suns do drop off in that second half of the year and yeah um, to some extent, we probably have seen that. Uh, there's been an improvement there, but um, it's looking like they might be unlikely to play finals now as well. So, look, just factoring in all those um, aspects, for me, I that's think Noel Anderson's someone that's not going to burn you. He's not particularly highly owned. Um, so on the other end of the spectrum, bringing him in is more likely to probably hurt you than what it is to to, to send you up the rankings. And uh, yeah, for that reason, that's why I'd be jumping off of Noah Anderson, who if you picked him up at the right time, which was probably um, pre-buy uh, yeah. or even just after when he got on a bit of a scoring run, uh, you, you, it was probably a good pick and it's been a tick so far. He hasn't necessarily burnt you, but no. um, at this point you really need to find that sort of um, player that can sort of... Uh, catapult you into wherever you need to be whether it's contention or or peg back some rankings or to win your match up and for me I think Noel Anderson ticks that box yeah it's a good shout man I love that perspective for me the mid I'd be looking to trade out is Andrew Brayshaw I know he's been excellent maybe not so much last week but the prior five weeks to that he's been one of the top scoring midfield premiums for us rolling around. But if I'm letting fixture being any level of indicator about what I think could come, he's got GWS and Port over the next two weeks based on a five-week sample size and probably closer to 10 weeks, if I'm honest. They're two of the four hardest matchups for inside midfielders and they're both bad matchups for transition scoring which is where Brayshaw does still pick up a a lot of his scoring elements so for me Brayshaw has been a great pick certainly in this latter half of the season but over the next two weeks if I had the option and it's very luxurious and if again like all these trades we're making at the moment the the probability of backfiring is high just ask anyone that traded out of Nick Martin this week for example didn't that backfire? Um, that's the risks that we take at this point in time of the season of trading out guys with premium level potential, and it's why they've been in our team. So, But for me, if I w- was playing the fixtures, Brayshaw would probably be the mid I'd be jumping off. Louis, is the rucks just as simple as, man, if you've got one of Marshall, Gorn, Cherry, you're probably not trading and it really is only English or others that you're looking to trade out. Is it just that simple now for us? Yeah, I think it's as simple as that. Um, I wrote down Brody Grundy just for something yeah. different. I'm sure there's probably a couple of coaches that are that are still kicking around with him potentially, just had some other issues in their sides. Um, so I've got him down here. I don't see any need for Sydney to not let him take it easy over the next two weeks and, and get primed for finals. So, um, yeah, easy one there, I think. And, yeah, it's uh, a good job. You would be thinking along similar lines, I assume, with like a team. I think so. Like there, there might be a few that are running Grundy, a few that might be running a Cameron or a Meek or something like that. But really it's been a – it's been a five horse race through through our ruck line this year. And it, and it really is, unless you've got one of those big three, you're probably not looking to trade anyway um, outside of Grundy or something like that. So I've I'm got one out of left field for you. Ooh. What if you're running a Toby Nankovis? Oh, look, I'd probably... I think he's going perfectly fine and it's very luxury trade, but geez, aren't you nervous at the moment going against Marshall? and Cherry every single week um, well, yeah, with think, that combination. Yeah, right. yeah there's, there's every potential, even if um, Nank's dropping a 120, that he's still uh, getting 10, 15, and, you know, in some, in some uh, 
weeks, 30 points dropped on his head with a Tristan Cherry's um, recent form. So Yeah, it's very luxury trade, but that is that is the point with the season we are. And the blessing and the curse of luxury trade is you think you might be making just a 10 to 15 point incremental gain. The negative is you could drop 50 or 60 points as a result of it. So as long as you I think you pointed this out earlier, as long as your logic is sound and, and your reasoning halts water, well, this is the variable of football um, that we play. So, yeah, I, I don't know if I'd trade out Nank, but, geez, as, as people that are looking at Cherry and Marshall combinations and don't have them, you are hating it right now, especially if you're deep in league finals and rankings. Like, it's it's tough if you don't own those two right now. That's, that's for sure in AFL fantasy. Uh, let's talk forwards. Louis, that we'd trade out. We, we're going to talk about trade-ins and black bookers in a second that we want to look for for 2025. But is there a forward for you, not saying you should trade these guys out by the way, but rather saying if you had them, it would be a consideration. Are there any forwards for you you'd be saying, man, if you've got this guy, consider moving him on? Ryan Reynolds here for, I guess, my 100th Mint commercial. No, 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 don't, no, no, no. I mean, honestly, when I started this, I thought I'd only have to do like four of these. I mean, it's unlimited premium wireless for $15 a month. How are there still people paying two or three times that much? I'm sorry, I shouldn't be victim blaming here. Give it a try at mintmobile.com slash save whenever you're ready. $45 upfront payment equivalent to $15 per month. New customers on first three-month plan only. Taxes and fees extra. Speed slower above 40 gigabytes. See details. Um, yeah, it's, as you know, it's such a small pool in the forward line. Yeah. So... And, and it feels like every five weeks, the players that we're sort of eyeing off outside of that big four or five are rotating through. Uh, there's no real consistency there. I think um, one that was getting a bit of hype uh, a month or two ago was Ajay Simpkin. He was coming in cheap. Yeah. Uh, he dropped that 132 against the Eagles. And I think a lot of people sat up and thought this could be our guy who – at the start of the year, even I was a big um, believer that he would be one that would be um, relevant in our forward lines. Mm. It hasn't happened consistently anyway. Um, he looks like he's a bit of an 85 guy and failing that, he's more in the 60s. He's just not the player that he was uh, a couple of years ago and that's mostly just due to his role. There's a couple yeah. of young gun mids in there that are getting the opportunity and um, it's just not advantageous to North to to get the midfield minutes into Jai Simpkin like it is like a Wardlaw, an LDU um, and a Sheasel, these sorts of players who need that time in the midfield to develop. So for me, um, I'd say Jai Simpkin, time to jump off. He's got dogs and hawks in the last two. Yep. Uh, you can't even really point to recent form with Tigers and West Coast um, putting up a 78 average against both of those two sides. So um I would be able to cut ties with him pretty comfortably and I wouldn't mind jumping off of him onto maybe a more contentious guy as well because there's not a whole lot of points separating that um, sort of 6 to 10 range in the forward line. on any Yeah, given it's week. true. Yeah, you're right. Basically, it's we've got these big four guys that are highly owned across the format and then three or four guys, maybe four if you want to throw, you know, Philippou in the mix prior to um, the laid out. We're just running a combination of these guys and some weeks we get the 20-point upswing on others, whether it be a Moore, whether it be a Rankin, whether it be a Simkin, whether it be whoever. And then the next week we lose that 20-point advantage that we feel like we've got. So it, it does feel a little bit roller coaster through there. I'm going to go out a little bit chaotic because, you know, what what's a coaches panel podcast without a big call? But by the way, I'm not saying you should do this. I'm just saying you should consider this. Why not trade out a Jai Caldwell? Um, highly owned, highly popular, but they've got Sydney and Brisbane over the next two weeks. It's a not a pretty matchup for inside mids against both of those two teams. Now, I don't think if any tag is coming, it's not coming to him. It certainly would come towards Zach Merritt, if anyone, but it's a little bit of a tough matchup for the next two weeks. And also these last three weeks, I still feel like while Parrish coming in has been good for, for Essendon overall, it does feel like this midfield mix that felt like it was quite settled over the few months or so before that has seen some change. So how does Shield merit Durham, who's had the biggest centre bounce change to his 
positioning Parish and now Caldwell. How do these five work? together effectively and I, I don't feel like they've resolved that at the moment and so yeah if you want to create some deviation from the pack I, I don't really like any of the options that you'd be trading into from him which is why I'd hesitate to really drive it hard for you but again much in that Hayden Young style of conversation that you mentioned that be it there are better and more options available in the defensive line there is a world where Caldwell dishes up the underwhelming scores that we've seen most of our premium, and I use that word loosely, forwards this year, which is 90s, 120s one week, 60s and 70s the next. So am I saying do it? No, it's stupidly luxurious, and I don't know if many should or would do it. But, yeah, you want to create some separation from the pack? That'll do it. That's for sure. Whether you should is a different conversation. Um, what about the inverse of this then, Louis? Let's look at the players we would say you should trade into. So again, favorable role, favorable fixture, favorable form, favorable venue, all the things that we go, man, if I was trading into a guy this week in, week in this line, 100%, this is the player we'd be identifying. Who in the back line are you pretty keen on trading into this week? Uh, for me, I'm really liking what Jack Sinclair is doing. It feels like he's finally hit his straps. He was a bit of a slower starter. He's had a couple of injury woes. Um, and his role was thrown around just a little bit too often. Uh, he does play a good mixture of both. But um, about a month or probably maybe two months ago, I just saw something click there and he's, he's starting to play some consistent footy. He's got Geelong this week. Um, I don't have the stats in front of me right now that was something I forgot to do pre-pod but uh, the last couple of times he's played Geelong he's absolutely loved them and I think it's uh, upwards of a 110 average the last couple of times that he's uh, played against them Uh, so for me Jack Sinclair has the ceiling plays for a team that uh, is really good in terms of their scoring in the defensive half they love to give it to him uh, and I, I just think this is a guy that can potentially finish with a couple of 120s, which is exactly what you want from your defenders. I've got no doubt he'll be um, probably a top four scorer in defense for the last two weeks. Yeah, it's a good shout. I, I'm going to stay in the same game for my defender that I'd be trading into, and it's Max Holmes at under 800K. So again, if she's was out early in the round, all of a sudden now it opens up some money for you to jump on top of somebody else, like your Anderson up to somebody else if you wanted to do that. But um, he's got a great fixture of West Coast and this week's St Kilda. He's a top 10 player in the league of scoring from transition. And both of those two teams are are really favourable in what he can do, whether he plays across half back, gets a little bit of wing and or centre bounce. They do love to get the ball in his hands at any of those positional elements. And it wouldn't shock me to see him come out with back-to-back 110, 115 plus scores over these next two weeks. So for me, if I could get a piece of any defender this week, I'd, I'd look for a bit of Max Holmes. What about in the midfield? This is where we're hoping to maybe pop a big 120, 130 plus score. We might not need it as a VCC, but we'd love it in the midfield. Is there a premium midfielder you've got your eyes on for coaches to trade into this week? Uh, yeah, there is. And one with um, a really large ceiling in Adam Trelaw. So yeah. uh, nice. we know what he's done all year. Arguably his best um, year from a football sense and, and it's right up there in terms of a fantasy sense as well um, that he's played in his career. We've seen him go 140-plus multiple times. Uh, He's got North this week who uh, I assume give up big points to midfielders. I think he's a team Mm. that um, he'll he'll beat up on a little bit here. Um, And then in round 24, the Giants who obviously have um, Bedford who is going to tag Bont, I would presume, there. Based that should let time. Adam yeah. Trelaw get off the leash a little bit and there's going to be a little bit of skin in that game potentially in terms of top eight. So that's one where I can see Adam Trelaw really getting on his bike and, and trying to lift his team over the line if Bont uh, can't quite do that or if he's got someone else hanging off of him. So potentially there's some extra pill to go around within that midfield there. Um, he's the sort of player that I can see going a little bit like Jack Sinclair, 120 yeah. plus over the next two weeks, which is exactly what you want to see from your midfielders. 
Oh, 100%. And if, again, if it's a league focused or a ranking and you're keeping an eye on what those in and around you are, are, are sitting in, it's the type of player you feel nervous coming up against. You never feel safe that, oh, he's going to be a 105 guy or oh, he's going to get tagged and get a 90. He is the type of player that's got 150 potentials and pedigree, and he's done that this year, that, that you are extremely nervous about coming up against. And, and that's what you're looking for at this time of the season is ceiling, monster ceiling guys and and two really potential favourable moments for him. So I really like that shout. I'm going to stay... Uh, his best mate is Josh Dunkley. Um, for me, 901K, he's got the pies and the bombers over the next two weeks. And and right now, those two teams are two of the top four matchups for inside mids. And yes, Dunkley's had some roller coasterish moments for us this year, but much like Trelaw, you talk about a player that could put a a 150 on top of you, get to that 110, 120 marker by three-quarter time. He does what you talked about earlier on this podcast, Louis, where he brings the ability to score consistently 40, 50 points per game just through tackles alone, let alone what he could do through possessions and marks and kick goals. So to me, if I'm thinking there's a guy that could pop some 120-plus scores over the next couple of weeks based off fixture and based off historical pedigree, I really like Josh Dunkley. So, you know, the the ads and Josh uh, trio, duo, I, I don't mind that one from you. Rux. It, it seems yes. appropriate, doesn't it? I, I really it like that Dunkley call as well because there's been some rumours throughout the year at different times that Lockie Neal has been a little bit sore. Yeah. Obviously, he's their Rolls-Royce and, and who's going to be probably one of their biggest players in terms of getting them um, to a premiership. So... Um, I can see Dunkley really stepping up there and maybe, uh, yeah, filling up a bit. Yeah, it's true. Look, we kind of talked about the Rucks a, a little bit before, but Tim English owners are obviously pivoting off that with him confirmed to be out. The Tuesday late afternoon club injury list came out and confirmed it. It does just feel like Louis Marshall cherry like marshall has got a great matchup this week at geelong over the last five they're a plus 20 matchup it's juicy and scary all at the same times and i just don't know if you don't have marshall or cherry that you're probably trading into any other and that's no disrespect to gorn it's more gosh these two are just so good at the moment aren't they yeah spot on uh it's probably the easiest trade you'll make in fantasy this year yeah no it's true all right before we get to the black book and wrap up Let's give people a forward they could trade into. We've mentioned some guys you could jump off of. I'm not a huge fan of trading into F6 at the moment. I I just don't think you're gaining much. But let's help people that aren't happy with their F6 upgrade that a little bit. Who are you trading into your forward line if indeed you were looking for a forward this week? Um, Yeah, so mine may be a bit out of left field. I'm not sure I've seen him mentioned too much. But that being said, my finger hasn't been... Exactly on the pole. See that uh, Matt Kennedy is yeah. one that I'm really liking. Uh, coming off a 134, which is quite convenient, um, but did play an absolute ripper on the weekend. Has the West Coast Eagles and St Kilda in the next two weeks. Uh, in the previous two weeks, uh, he's had pretty high midfield usage, which is good to see going at um, 42 and 56%. As I mentioned earlier on in the podcast, there's been quite a few injuries at the Blues, so I'm not sure that sub-risk is necessarily as high anymore. I'm not going to rule it out by any means, but um, I think he's going to be a player who's a little bit more senior and talented enough that the Blues can rely on um, to see if they can edge into that top eight and uh, and play some finals. It's uh, well, He's got a 76 average, which is pretty low for a bloke that's gone over 100 six times. And, yeah. Uh, that's obviously been sub-affected uh, over a couple of different weeks. But in terms of matchup, in terms of ceiling, um, I, I really don't mind this pick. I think this is one that you could take a fly on. I wouldn't necessarily really consider it if I was up there in the rankings. No. Um, but if you had nothing to lose, if you maybe rank, I don't know, 2,000 and you think, okay, where can I take a fly? I really don't mind this one. I, I think it potentially has um, plenty of upside. Well, it's got upside at the price, but um, it really could pay dividends in terms of the scoring. 
Well, you mentioned that high ceiling game last week. I agree that the sub risk is gone. Maybe there's a slight risk they play him in a key position prospect with no Mackay or Kerno, just given how good of an overhead mark he is. But oh, I just don't think they can do that. He, he he was the best Blues player on the weekend um, against the Hawks. So I, I'm with you. I think, man, you want to find a guy that's got 130 potentials about him, six tons this year. Yeah, I, I can't see too many really trading into him, so I really like that shout. Um, I mentioned this player last week as a trade out. Ironically, talk about trading him back. In, it's Luke Jackson um, with Fremantle insinuating that Darcy's done for the year. I don't know if it's publicly confirmed, but it is pretty much in every possible place that I can see, and maybe the club have come out and confirmed it, and I haven't confirmed that. But uh, to me... Luke Jackson, stupidly cheap, and he goes at an average of 90-plus in the nine games he's played this year without Sean Darcy. So to me, GWS and Port, GWS is a positive matchup. Port's not as good as it used to be for for Rucks, but he is the kind of player that can pop a 110 for you, and and they're favourable enough options for him and for Fremantle should that eventuate. So uh, to me... I don't love it, um, but if I wasn't loving my F6 and I just wanted to take a different poison, I'd trade into Luke Jackson, so to speak. So, yep, if you want to do that, you can absolutely step into that space. I, I like Elijah Hollands too. I mentioned him last week. I'll still happily stand by that, that Carlton fixture that you've alluded to, let alone now the depleted injury list they've got. I think it's something really like 17 players on the active injury list for the club at the moment. It's it's unfortunately wild that a, a combination of poor form and, and injuries is probably going to rob this club of, of finals, which would be an absolute disaster for them. Um, but it is unfortunately very much trending in a, in a challenging way. Um, before we wrap up the podcast... Let's open up the 2025 Black Book for coaches that could not give two stuffs about the rest of 2024 and are now just thinking about the 2025 preseason. We want to give them something, let alone coaches, just to mark a player's name down to give you a little insight about who we at the coaches panel are interested to watch what their 2025 preseason and ultimately position, price, all those things come into for the coming season. Uh, you got a name or two for us, Louis, that you just want to tell coaches, yep, put it in your AFL Fantasy Black Book for 2020. You know when you reach that age where everyone and their mother won't shut up about their credit scores, yet it seems like no one really understands what's so special about those three random numbers? That's because credit scores are meaningless. Unless you have Credit Karma to show you how to use them. We use those three random numbers, plus your financial profile, to help you find your next opportunity. Like a more rewarding credit card, a game plan that helps you pay down debt faster, or a personal loan to help you save more on interest payments each month. Cha-ching! Download Intuit Credit Karma today to get started. Fine. Yeah, I do. I've got one that's a little bit out of the box. I think there's um, quite a few players which most coaches would be putting straight in their black book. So I just wanted to go a little bit more unique. Uh, Mm -hmm. For me, it's Will Day. And uh, he's currently averaging 79 at the moment. Uh, He's had an injury-interrupted year. He's had an injury-interrupted preseason coming off winning the uh, Peter Crimmins medal last year. Uh, Obviously, the Hawks BNF. Average 96, um, so he's potentially 15 points underpriced going into next year. Uh, the role isn't really an issue. Hawks no. play an extremely tight midfield mix. Uh, you've, you've pretty much got Newcomb, Warple, Nash and Day in there. Day's their future. He's still quite young. I'd, I'd be surprised if he was much older than 23. Um, he's, he's definitely going to be their player uh, that they rely on and their future leader there. So... I think in 2025, he's got all the potential to bounce back up to that 96 range, which 15 points in the midfield um, you would certainly tick off. I also think he's got that potential to to break out into that 105 range potentially. And um, he, he was one that I, I sort of had penciled in this year to, to take that step up from 96. So keep an eye on him. If he does a full preseason this year or rather next year, um, I, I think he's one that will not only bounce back, but potentially could exceed that and uh, be a great starting pick for us. And um, 
quite often these players that are coming up through a team that has another level to go to. Um, I know the Hawks are playing some great footy at the moment, but yeah. I think most uh, AFL pundits would sort of say that Hawks are going to go better again and then, you know, potentially better again. They're definitely on the up. So Will Day being a part of that, um, I think is going to be good for his fantasy scoring. Yeah, I love that chat. He is the perfect starting squad option for us next year, which is if he pays off, man, we've got a 105 guy at a 80-ish price point. If he dies in the first week or two, well, we go and jump on the guy that pops. We get the Max Holmes of this year. We go and get the Will Setterfields of last year. And if he's meddling around the 90s, well, he's still going to make you 50-odd grand. So... I think he's spot on the money for us for the type of player we want, let alone proven pedigree of he's got 110 potential over a six, eight week stretch, let alone what he could do for a year. So I love that shout. I know not too many people are thinking about 2025 too publicly just yet, but this is why we do our black bookers over the final month of the year. It's just a name. You put it down and you can come back and look at it in December and January of the, of the coming preseason. Uh, for me, I want to put a giant caveat on the name I'm about to say, and the reason is simple. If he gets traded, then I'm in on this guy. If he stays, and when I say traded, I mean he's a a free agent. If he moves clubs, I'm keen. If he stays put, well, he's still in the black book, but my interest dwindles a little bit. I want to put Isaac coming in the black book for 2025. He's played four games this year. He's now had back-to-back seasons averaging in the 60s. As a result, his price will be linked to his 2023. So it's about a high 60s average. So you slap a really juicy discount on top of that. We could potentially getting a guy in the 50s range. And he was just two years now removed where he went 90 plus for us in AFL fantasy. So if he moves and it does look like Port Adelaide is the leading club, especially with the potential Dan Houston move over to Melbourne, all of which these have just been purely rumour and innuendo. But geez, and Isaac coming, coming off a discount, which is already based off 25 points of value based on what we know he can do. So 20 points of value plus the discount if he lands at a new club that need a run and carry distribution and good ball user. Yeah, I want every piece of Isaac coming in my side. So, yeah, I'm I'm interested in that. Louis, what what's your take? You're you're the pair supporter of the panel. Should Houston go? And it's a big variable that's not confirmed yet. Neither should it be, given where Port Adelaide's season is still very nicely tracking. Is Isaac someone that could fit that void for you, or does a does a Farrell hold that spot instead? I think there's a lot of points up for grabs if if Houston's on the way out. So I do like it. I think at the price point, um, you're not going to go too wrong there. I'm not sure where it'll be. I imagine it'll be sort of close to what we had a Zach Williams this year, maybe even a little bit less. Um, Back-to-back seasons, 85 plus a couple of years ago, is going to be looking for opportunity. That new club bounce, I think there's uh, there's definitely a strong case to be made for him. Port defenders sort of all go at about that 75 to 85 range. They share it around quite a bit, and that would mm. that would be plenty to, to warrant the pick. I think Kane Farrell yeah. maybe has a bit of a bump. I think uh, Bergman is probably due for a bit of a bump. He's one That's that I'd too. be um, looking at in keepers pretty strongly with Dan Houston out. But um, coming coming into that mix as well, I think, is... Uh, is a seriously good shout. So, yeah, I find it hard to believe, given his fit and at another football club, that he won't be a part of uh, most coaches' defensive lines. Yeah, no, it's fair enough. Hey, mate, we've we've loved having you back on the podcast this week and certainly have missed you throughout the 2024 season. A lot of life has happened for you, but we're super glad that you can make some time for us on this episode. We can hear your dulcet tones and certainly hope to see and hear a little bit more of you in 2025. Thanks for being back on the Coaches Panel AFL Fantasy Roundtable, mate. Thanks for having me, mate, and, and thanks to all the listeners for tuning in as well.
Uh, if you want to go and check out this podcast, you can as a YouTube episode. The video is out every single AFL Fantasy Strategy Roundtable. Just simply search and then subscribe to the Coaches Panel out on YouTube and then making sure you're picking up. There's shorts that drop every couple of days over there. So it's not just the long-form videos, but there's shorts available. Subscribe, get those notifications on because while your 2024 season might be wrapping up, when the trade period gets cracking, we drop a video episode it is exclusive to youtube exclusive video for every single player that moves clubs we give you our first take thoughts on that so make sure you go and check that out if you haven't subscribed and given a positive five-star rating and review wherever you get your audio podcast make sure you do that as well and our patreons get plenty of content not only during the season proper but during the off season starting in october kane and myself drop our f- top 50 keeper ranks break the players down into eight tiers and over a two month period we tell you who we think are the most valuable 50 players in keeper leagues and why make sure if you do play keepers you don't want to miss this series with now i think we're up to our fourth year of doing it it's probably one of my favorite um episodic things that we get to be a part of here at the coaches panel so if you play keepers or you just want a little bit of an early insight into the players we are highly valuing and why that might give you a little early insight into 2025's rankings, then maybe just worth subscribing to that. All the details of where you become part of our Patreon, as well as all of the links to get in touch with us are in the description of this video. Can you believe it? There's just 18 games of AFL fantasy to go in your 2024 season. We hope for you over these 18 games, that you land on the right side of injury luck, that your trades, as luxurious as they might be, are favorable and you nail your VC early in the week so you don't have to have some Sunday scared moments of who you're dropping the C on. Good luck in your preliminary final or maybe even your grand final league matchup this week. If you're in the top 100 or pushing for it in AFL Fantasy, we hope you go well this week and we'll be back with you one last time, this time next week, giving you our final AFL Fantasy Strategy Roundtable focused on 2024.